The complexities of being a human being coupled with our characteristics, if not from the perspective of another human being, shouldn't matter, yet they do. After the abolishment of slavery 154 years ago in 1865, then the passing of the Civil Rights Bill over 55 years ago, should the then Negro, now black, African American, still be the reason for the success of other races while being subjugated to ghettos and inadequate education and death at the hands of the police? After the women's rights movement began in 1848, 171 years ago, followed by the Women's Right to Vote Act in 1920, 99 years ago, why, why do some women still have to sue a company for back pay after she finds out a man has been paid more, yet does the same job? Or worse, maybe her, is her subordinate. Forty years later, after the Stonewall Inn incidents of gays being harassed or beaten in New York by police, why is it still not surprising to hear of hate crimes against gays that often end in death? Ninety years after the Holocaust, why do we still have bombing of synagogues and anti-Semitic rhetoric? Should race, nationality, gender, and sexual orientation really matter when we're all fighting for the same goal, peace on earth? All the complexities that must have played James Baldwin to be an international spokesperson for the equality of blacks during the civil rights era when the adjective Negro was used to describe blacks, African Americans. Furthermore, how perplexing it must have been to endure the whispers from other blacks as to the nature of his sexual orientation while he risked his life for all Negroes. And how to some he may have and how Song may have used his gift as a brilliant orator against him as a means to distance themselves to justify their disdain by saying, he doesn't speak for me. Audience members, it is both an honor and a pleasure to be granted this interview and to be sharing the same space in time with novelist, playwright, and activist, Mr. James Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin, Mr. Baldwin interrupts the interviewer, please call me James. Interviewer, thank you, sir. James, you've traveled around the world and you've debated in front of predominantly white audiences about inequality of the Negro in America. I feel that without your contribution to the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would not have probably would have probably taken longer to become part of legislation. I won't ask you to speculate on my speculation if it's correct. I've seen enough, heard enough of your interviews to know that you really don't dabble in speculation. James smiles. James, I want to broach this next subject matter in a how shall I word it. We're blood in the same vein. James says, well, I'm both flattered and intrigued. Explain. Well, I feel, if I may say, people like me who are gifted, who have been gifted to be a voice for all, face the same complexities you did. Well, Mr. Bowen, I mean James, it's been 31 years since your death and 55 years since the Civil Rights Act became legislation and 100 years since slavery was abolished, and prior to that, 400 years of slavery. I believe we've seen enough of our history to know our past. We live in the now. Presently, collectively, we still are not getting along well enough to be considered unified. It is because of this lack of unity and non-inclusiveness, the inability to include all of our people, that we are still the source of the American dream for all other ethnic groups immigrating here. I'm concerned for our future, James. James Baldwin responds, I understand your concern. You may feel as though you want to be an activist for your community, your people, but not everyone will be willing to accept the reality that they need help or someone to rally their causes 
Therefore, they will not accept you, your ideologies, your philosophies. It's nothing personal. If you're seeking 100% approval, you'll be the first person since the creation of man to achieve it. Concern yourself not with the quantity of people that don't subscribe to you, but rather with the quality of people that can propel you. That's good advice, James. I interviewed, I viewed your 1987 interview with Mavis on 4 on YouTube. Aside from you never admitting to your sexual orientation because you believe love is love, in which I agree, so 55 years later, I won't ask. Yet, some people want to know. Yet, you still spoke of equality for all people, especially Negroes, but you could have easily turned your back on the Negro plight in America and simply became a self-promoter of your books. Why did you feel so compelled to continue to speak against the inequality of the Negro in America? James responds, because the more collective voices one has behind him, the more collectively the voices will be heard. James, you're my idol. I look up to you. I'm seeking your advice, your counsel. Should I live my truth via my media platform? James responds, are you seeking to set yourself free by revealing your truth or are you seeking others to set you free by revealing your truth? If the latter is your goal, you will never be freed. Understand this, salvation is an admission ticket for only one person. You gain it through your quest for knowledge. After you have attained it, only you can walk in your newfound faith. No one person or people will be in total unison of your fate through your faith, your salvation. If your goal is, as you say, to be a voice for all, especially blacks, African Americans, and youth, then let that pride be your guide. People have been, and are, and will be distracted by your truth. When you speak, they won't hear what you're saying. They will only be distracted by your truth, which, is, which will be totally different than what you're saying. I advise you to follow my counsel. Focus on the goal at hand while removing as many possible distractions. After all, the goal is not about you, so your truth is both personal and private and should remain as such. Thank you. You debated, your debate is the American dream at the expense of the American Negro against William F. Buckley is considered historic. James, do you still share this view? Yes. However, it's with an interesting twist. I'll say this as a disclaimer. Everyone should have a chance at success, whether born here or as an immigrant. The beneficiary of the American dream is no longer the white man per se, who built America with both involuntary and voluntary labor of the Negro. The American dream beneficiary now belongs to other races, other than black, who come to America and open, and open stores in areas they don't live in, nor do they give back. So yes, the American dream is still at the expense of the American Negro. A ghetto will remain a ghetto as long as the residents within, within are a minority of the business owners within said ghetto. Black labor used to perpetuate the American dream is not as it was during the time of the Industrial Revolution. It is now the age of technical, logical revolution. However, minorities still suffer from inequality through inferior education. That is, if the child isn't in a predominantly white school. Public schools still fail to offer amenities that are offered at better schools. Even the curriculum at better schools offer job-ready skills versus a school that doesn't offer job-ready skills in the urban areas. 
if a child isn't exposed to technology, then that child is at a disadvantage. Also, it is easy to outsource technological jobs because one does not have to be in the same city, state, or country. So the jobs won't be here for those who didn't get the early exposure to facilitate the concept of computers are fun. Black people are the pawns in this life's chess game. There are now different players and a new chess board. The multiple variables make it that much more difficult for minorities to maneuver, let alone survive. Unifying and sharing knowledge and wealth is essential to solving this problem, giving back. Minorities contend with racism, self-hate, division within the race based on shade, gender, and sexual orientation, religious affiliation, and socioeconomic differences. Because disproportionately we can't get along, we will be enslaved and the fruit of our collective labor will be the source of every other ethnic group's cash register. Thank you, James. Do you feel as though the African American's consciousness has evolved? James responds, African Americans, blacks, must strive to evolve both their individual and collective consciousness just like they do when they go to church to, to develop both their individual and spiritual consciousness through fellowship. It does not occur unless they seek it. Why go to church and listen to a sermon about fellowship? Then after the sermon is over, the thought process is, I just came for the word. I don't want to have anything to do with these people. Furthermore, to answer your question, do I feel as though the African American's consciousness has evolved? Let me say this first. I believe, as I have witnessed it for myself over the years, there has been and is and will forever be a two steps forward and three steps back phenomenon in the American social struggle to achieve equality by all minority groups of people. However, it is not until a significant amount of turmoil has occurred for a group of people to collectively have their consciousness awakened and more importantly, take action to bring about resolve and evolve their collective consciousness. Now, I will ask your question. Has the African American's consciousness evolved? The answer is yes, it is now evolving. The collective consciousness has been awakened due to the black lives being lost due to police shootings. This phenomenon is twofold. African Americans, blacks, need to address their de-evolution. Black men who wear their pants below their ass. I realize that this, this is a, a young person's dress code to rebel against traditional values of the generation before them. But it's, it is also a mentality that ages out like kindergarten. At what age do you pull your pants up? I've seen men who don't want to grow up wear this look. The black woman is not a thought. We can come up with new adjectives to disrespect women, but can't do improper fractions such that when we go to a car dealership or a mortgage lender, we get bamboozled. Ladies, the black man is not a bitch ass nigga. The black dollar should not be everyone else's dollar except the black business owners. As long as the mentality is low, the police and the rest of the world will view the African American as less than human as portrayed by the media. Our young people have been rats following the Pied Piper of trap music into the ocean to drown by music that devalues human life for the profit of a dollar with fake gangsters, drug selling music videos with a backdrop of gunshots as a soundtrack for three generations, having produced nothing but dead bodies and prison inmates and new shooting targets for the police. Be awakened people, you've seen the past, you know the present, now what are you going to do to save your future now that your consciousness has been called to evolve? Oprah said in an interview, one would think that the evolution of consciousness is linear, but it is not. We have not been moving consistently forward. We have indeed taken some steps back. 
Justin Fairman, author of Mapping the Evolution of Consciousness, suggests, from what I gather, it is not our con- it is that our consciousness evolves when our needs are met holistically. I believe African Americans, blacks, have the resources to know where to start, which is economic empowerment. Let me go back to something you asked me earlier. You asked me if you should use your media platform to reveal your truth. I don't believe that one's job is the place to live their truth. The place of employment, whether it be your platform or someone else's place of business, is the place where business is supposed to take place. Yes, the American workforce has been fraught with lack of production because not only do co-workers date and bring issues back to the workplace, but the inability of races to coexist slows production as well. Not to mention the influx of different nationalities that bring different moral and value systems and religious beliefs. It's no wonder why jobs are outsourced. In closing, as I can see we're running out of time, America wants to be great again, but that would only be accomplished once the majority of people work to collectively to live in peace through tolerance led by a spirit of inclusiveness. Interviewers, as usual, well said, James. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. I want to thank Mr. James Baldwin for allowing us to channel his energy and thoughts in today's topic is the American dream still at the expense of the black African-American in 2019.